on cybercrime. There was this initial perception that Internet domains were free money. But now the domain name gold rush is over and cyber squatters could find themselves in trouble with the law. We'll take a look at two of the landmarks. It's the newest fad in pirating software. Head on it for a fraction of the price using online auction sites. We'll show you how investigators pinpoint the pirate. another show this week. No doubt the big news in cybercrime was carnivore and the fact that the FBI was called out to defend its surveillance system before Congress. We'll have coverage of that hearing plus the latest on the recording industry's attempt to shut down Napster. But before we get to those headlines, here's Jennifer with this week's top story. Jen? Thanks, Alex. With scores of competing websites out there, don't ever underestimate the value of a good net address. Cyber squatters or people who register trademark domain names with the intent of selling them for a profit have known that for a long time. But now there can be a legal cost associated with that. This week we examine two recent cyber squatting cases that have already become legal landmarks. If you type in the URL worldwrestlingfederation.com, you won't find the official site for the wrestling organization. And it's not because there are too many characters in the URL. It's because until recently, the WWF didn't have rights to that domain name. Someone else did. An individual by the name of uh, Michael Bosman had registered WorldWrestlingFederation.com uh, shortly after they increased the string of alphanumeric characters to allow such a long name to be registered. And within a very short time, he contacted the World Wrestling Federation and offered to sell it to them for a substantial amount of money. Some might call Bosman an entrepreneur. Others would call him a cyber squatter. The WWF did, and Bosman found himself involved in the first cyber squatting case arbitrated by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Attorney Scott Donahue was on the ICANN panel that decided Bosman's case. The ICANN procedure is designed to uh, determine whether or not someone has acted in bad faith in registering and using a domain name and is trading on the reputation and goodwill that has been established by the holder of a mark. The result was that Bosman had acted in bad faith and uh, ordered that the name be returned, uh, transferred to the World Wrestling Federation. The ICANN procedure is important to both the legal and Internet communities because it provides an alternative to filing a lawsuit under the controversial Anti-Cybersquatting Consumer Protection Act. Signed into law late last year, the act is designed to crack down on people who register trademarks with the intent of selling it back to the mark holder. And like many Internet terms and catchphrases, the origin of cybersquatting can be traced back to the offline world. Squatters are people who take over someone else's property without their consent. Many times it's an abandoned building like the one I'm in right now. Well, in the online world, the address is virtual, the property intellectual. So, what's the controversy? Most would not argue against protecting someone else's property. But in cyberspace, making that determination is not all that easy. And some contend the anti-cybersquatting act makes it harder. I believe that it harms individuals and small businesses in an impermissible way and skews the playing field badly. Nikki Berry is president of the Domain Name Rights Coalition. Her agency is in charge of helping those accused of cyber squatting. She says under the new law, corporate America has an unfair advantage over the little guy. While it seems to be a good idea, um, and it's couched in terms of protecting the consumer, there are some significant problems with the, with the act. Um, it's currently being used as a threat by large entities going after smaller entities whose domain names they want. Barry also maintains the act can be used to stifle freedom of speech. Take, for example, PETA.com. That's the official website for the animal rights group, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. 
When the URL PETA.org was registered to an individual for use as a parody site, PETA.com cried foul. Someone registered that for use of a parody website, People Eating Tasty Animals. Now, under the First Amendment to the Constitution, parody is protected. However, he lost that lawsuit. The People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals took the domain name away from him. But if you ask attorney Adam Belsky of the San Francisco law firm Belsky & Gross, he'll tell you the Anti-Cyber Squatting Act is necessary and can actually help protect the little guy. In order to be liable under the new anti-cyber squatting law, you have to have a bad faith intent to profit from your use of someone else's mark. So if you registered the name Nike.com because you wanted to sell it back to Nike, the trademark holder, then you're in trouble. If you registered Nike.com because you want to put up photographs of your dog Nike and let your relatives and friends see Nike, you are not violating the cyber squatting law. Consider the America's Cup races, a sailing competition old as the wind. Two New Zealanders were slashed with a lawsuit under the Anti-Cyber Squatting Act after they registered americascup.com. The site they created competed with squatka.com's site, the official online host for the event. They used official logos. They made it appear as if there was, it was some sort of a officially sponsored, officially sanctioned website. Um, and uh, were then using that to make money off of the America's Cup. They hoped to hold the domain name, which is very valuable, for ransom. And they also hoped to make money from advertising in the interim until the America's Cup bought back their name, essentially. A name that's been trademarked for years. A clear case of cyber squatting, it never went to trial. The two men settled with Quata. So is the threat of a lawsuit under the new act enough to scare off future cyber squatters? Just as you have trademark infringers running around in the the real world, you'll continue to have trademark infringers running around in cyberspace as well. I think it will serve as a deterrent, but just as uh, I think laws against murder serve as a deterrent, but they don't stop murder. An interesting thing about the ICANN proceeding is it can happen in 45 days. Now, the first case was the World Wrestling Federation that you referred to in your story, and that was in January. What, yes. What's happening since then? Well, since then, 500 cases have been decided, and there are 1,000. I'm told there are 1,000 cases pending. So clearly we're getting an indication that the legal community and the Internet community is seeing the ICANN procedure as a reasonable alternative to filing a lawsuit. Right. Well, there's no judicial proceeding that's going to happen in a matter of 45 days. So that is... That that's definitely a very positive. Famous marks, it makes sense to me. You have like the Nike example right, in your you story. About Nike. Um, Marbo, names that we're familiar with. What about famous names? Well, that, you bring up a good point, Alex, because very clearly, if like we use the, the Nike example in the story, that is a trademark name, and you can you can pretty much figure out intent if there's bad faith intent if you register Nike.com. But when it comes to say a famous name, that brings up a whole other area, and we're starting to see cases where people are registering famous names of people and then they're sort of holding them for ransom and even offering to sell them back. And that brings up a whole other area of cyber squatting. And so the World Intellectual Property Organization is considering expanding ICANN's jurisdiction to include protection of famous names. The law that deals with cyber squatting, it's... Uh it's a little tricky. It is a little you know, tricky. You know, with a bad it's thing. You think about, like, Veronica. I know there was a case involving that from right. Archie's Comics. Mm-hmm. And, again, that could be either way. So I think that it's going to be tricky as we go along the way. But uh, we'll continue to follow these legal landmarks. Thanks very much for the report. You're welcome. Uh, now turning to our poll. No doubt you have a strong opinion about cyber squatting. So tell us what you think. If you agree with the Anti-Cyber and Consumer Protection Act, like A, if instead you think the ICANN procedure is the way to go and you don't need more lawsuits flooding the court, pick it. Or perhaps you disagree with both approaches and think, first come, first serve, cyber squatting should be allowed. That's C. We want to know. Vote at cybercrime.com. And if you want to debate the weekly poll question, then bring it on in our chat. The CyberCon staff is there to talk every Monday from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we've made it easy for you. You can chat with us while you watch the rebroadcast of the show. And here's another reason to go to CyberCon.com, our security scanner. It is located at the top right-hand corner of the page. The scanner gives your computer a virtual checkup. Can you use for the top five viruses like the Life Stages virus, the Love Bug, or CIH? It can also check to see whether your browser blocks adult-related materials. 
and don't be shy. After you try it, let us know what you think, good or bad. Email us your comments at scannerfeedback at gdtv.com. Still ahead on cybercrime. Carnivore is simply an investigative tool that helps us to investigate online in the same way as in the physical world. The FBI's Carnivore surveillance system is going fire in Washington. So, does the system violate your privacy rights online? The details next. Cybercrime news this week, a small victory for Napster. Late Friday afternoon, Cybercrime learned the song swapping service won an emergency stay on a court order issued earlier this week. Napster filed the motion on Wednesday after a federal judge issued a preliminary injunction against company ordering Napster cease operations by midnight Friday. You may recall when issuing the initial decision, Judge Marilyn Patel cited the high likelihood that the Recording Industry Association of America would win its lawsuit against Napster. Upon hearing the initial ruling, General Counsel for the RIAA had this to say. Our hope is that the court's decision, which was very, very clear and very, very strong, will send a very clear signal to all of those other companies making litigation unnecessary. On Friday, before the emergency stay was granted, Napster's CEO Hank Berry urged its 20 million users to show their support by buying their favorite CDs in a boycott. He also asked that they write a letter to the record companies telling them they support the artists. The final decision on whether to shut down Napster for good will be made when the case goes to trial at the end of the year. Meantime, the FBI takes the offense on Capitol Hill. At issue, its new email wiretapping tool called Carnivore. The system can be programmed to sift through millions of email messages looking for a specific suspect. Critics of Carnivore fear it compromises the privacy of law-abiding citizens. But this is a uh, totally new environment, and I think that uh, the FBI has to step gingerly. But we all obviously have a responsibility to uh, engage in legitimate law enforcement activities uh, in terms of surveillance. But who monitors this? And I just want to emphasize to you and to the American people that this is a... Uh, a tool that is deployed rarely, and it is never deployed without a court order. In the last year alone, Carnivore has been used in 16 cases investigating terrorism, child pornography, and credit card fraud. Stay with us. There's more coming up on Cybercrime. He was selling them all over the country. It wasn't just in San Jose, but he was selling them in almost all 50 states. On the internet. This undercover investigator is talking about a man who sold pirated software using online auction sites. See how the San Jose High Tech Police picks up the pirate next. <laughs> When it comes to online auction sites, for the most part, our show has concentrated on auction fraud. Maybe you never received the product. Perhaps it's not exactly what you bargained for. Or maybe, like one viewer emailed us recently, all you got was a brick in the mail. Well, the truth is, some buyers are getting exactly what they want, counterfeit software. But here are some of the risks that should keep consumers alert. This is a new one, current bid, $8. $8 for an expensive piece of software. The software retails for $3,500. A quick search of the big auction sites reveals dozens of offers. So many offers, in fact, that it keeps this technical investigator who wishes to remain anonymous busy full time. She works for the San Rafael, California software company, Autodesk. And even if you're not familiar with its products, no doubt that you've seen what the 3D computer-aided design software can do. Architects and engineers are designing objects, they're designing buildings with our products. They're selling their intellectual property to other people, um, but they're not paying for the intellectual property of our company. Over the past 10 years, Sandra Bolton's Piracy Prevention Department has recovered more than $40 million in software. If you buy the software package, you 
you purchased a license to use our software, which is not transferable. So for us, buying something on any time you see something on an auction site in a product that's software, it's not legitimate. Holton says for every legitimate copy out there, there's between five and seven illegal ones. Anastasia Canita of San Jose, California, is part of a new breed, the casual counterfeiter. Earlier this year, in his spare time, he auctioned off pirated software. He was selling them all over the country. It wasn't just in San Jose, but he was selling them in almost all 50 states on the Internet. This undercover high-tech crimes investigator with the San Jose Police Department fielded the anonymous tip. In two months, using Yahoo Auctions, Canada sold software valued at more than $400,000. Autodesk's AutoCAD 2000, retail price nearly $4,000. Canada's starting bid, $35. Quark Express, retail price nearly $1,000. Canada's starting bid, $25. There's no doubt in my mind, or most people's mind, that they knew in fact, because of the price they were purchasing it for, it was in fact counterfeit or copied software. A search warrant of Canada's home yielded evidence including master copies of Quark Express and AutoCAD 2000. San Jose police also confiscated scanners, CD writers, and blank CDs, all used to create the illegitimate software he kept at his home. And this is where the legitimate Autodesk software is housed. If this warehouse in Northern California is the Autodesk Bank, then I'm standing in the vault. Behind this cage are literally thousands of CDs. And when you combine that with the literature, it's valued at tens of millions of dollars. But Canada's customers got no literature, no shrink wrap, no serial numbers, no support, and sometimes not even a working product. Still, business was good. And Canada's full-time job as an accountant bookkeeper carried over nicely to his counterfeiting business. These were actually names and addresses of people who purchased the software. He kept really detailed records, so we know each and every individual how much they paid for the software. And they're going to be very surprised when they get a letter from our attorney, I think. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be there. <laughs> The letter reads, Mr. Canada's records indicate that you purchased counterfeit copies of Autodesk software products from him for a nominal amount of money. Infringers can face up to $150,000 for each copy plus attorney's fees. Whenever you purchase something at that type of price, you're victimizing the company, which in fact, who's going to ultimately pay the price for that software? It's going to be you and I in the raised prices because the companies can't afford to suffer those losses. In June, Canada pleaded guilty to three state felony counts and was sentenced to 11 months in county jail. Even if you look at the fact that what if he only does six months out of the 11 months? Was that worth the price of losing a very well-paying job? having your family embarrassed like that and then the potential of losing your house? you got to ask yourself that question. I asked Sandra Bolton, who you met in the story, why she thought so many people pirate software. I mean, worldwide losses for software piracy in 1999 were over $11 billion. She said it's cultural. You're alone in your home. There's this sense that there's no risk. But as we saw in this story, the victim companies are seeking large civil damages from the buyers. And even though the San Jose PD says they're not pursuing criminal charges, you should know that if you've done business with Anastasio Canada, the feds are now reviewing the case. There's still more ahead. So there are targets for cybercrime for the first time, and they're not expecting it, and they're not used to it. Ryan Leland from SonicWall discusses what the Internet will be like three years down the road. What are the new risks users face with advances in technology? The Chaos Theory is next. Hi, welcome back. Time again for Chaos Theory. Always on connections like cable modems and DSL lines have clear-cut advantages, but there can be disadvantages. 
Brian Leland, the VP of Marketing for SonicWall, says more time online could mean a higher risk of attack. Take a look at his chaos theory. In the next three years, several hundred thousand people who use their computers and the internet for a variety of purposes and have always been and felt safe will no longer be safe. That's the whole population that for the last or several years have used dial-up lines to get into internet service providers. Over the next couple of years, those people will go to DSL and cable connections. And DSL and cable connections are always on. So they're a target for cybercrime for the first time, and they're not expecting it, and they're not used to it. Why are they a target? Well, partially, there's a whole new range of people looking for them who are not in the higher echelons of cyber criminals, but are looking for easy local targets for bragging rights at school. Dentists, lawyers, uh, accountants, those kind of people are ideal for that because it digs up information that's relevant, local, and you, you can nice to recognize the people whose data you steal. So another chaos theory is done. And so are we. Thank you for watching. Make sure you join us next week when we bring you a half hour special on the biggest hacker convention in the world, DEF CON. To show the public that hackers aren't like evil and bad. For the eighth year in a row, the massive hacker conference will take place in Las Vegas. Thousands of members of the underground and even some feds trying to keep a low profile will attend. Jen and I will be there this weekend to huddle with the hackers. We'll bring you all the highlights in a full report next week. But if you can't wait until then, swing by our website to watch our exclusive video and text coverage from patriotic hacking to social engineering to what the feds are up to at DEF CON. We're posting tons of video this weekend beginning Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, then the next day's events at 9 p.m. Sunday. This is great stuff. You'll find it at cybercrime.com. Until then, if you have story ideas or questions for our two three panelists, Email us at cybercrime at gdtv.com. And don't forget to join us in chat Monday, chat Monday. from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.